everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Loop, and I am the Events and Programs Chair and the Secretary for Traverse Area Historical Society. Welcome you to our presentation today. Um, it looks like most of you are on mute, which is great. Um, we will do questions after this talk. So if you want to put questions in the chat, that would be wonderful. We'll also try to get to questions at the end. Um, I would love to introduce Peg Siciliano. Peg is a board member for the Traverse Area Historical Society. She's lived in Traverse City for 35 years. Um, she's a trained archivist and she has a master's in American history. And Traverse Area Historical Society would also like to thank um, Tattle, Traverse Area District Library for helping us host these programs. Um, if you want more information on our historical society, traversehistory.org. We're always looking for new members to help um, for various volunteer projects and also just people interested in local history. So again, I'd like to introduce Peg Siciliano and she'll get us started. Hello there. Um, hopefully you'll all be looking at a screen that shows a slide saying 2020 in review, unprecedented times. So that's the first slide and there's gonna be a lot more slides coming up through this. The actual talk should last 40 minutes, maybe 45 with a lot of images and then time for questions afterwards if you want. Um, so I started out thinking about this because we keep hearing that today's COVID-19 pandemic is unprecedented. And in many ways it is, but in other ways it echoes events just within the memories of our oldest citizens. For in 1918, the world, including Traverse City, was overtaken by the Spanish flu pandemic. During this talk, I will be presenting similarities and differences between the two eras, focusing mostly on events in Northern Michigan from 1918 to 1920. Okay. The Spanish flu pandemic lasted for about two years, starting in February 1918 and winding down by April 1920. It had a mortality rate of approximately 2.5%. As of the beginning of January 2020, John Hopkins University estimates that while the death rate for COVID in the United States is relatively low, 1.7%, in Mexico, it's 8.7%. If you average those numbers together, you get slightly over 5%. Of course, our pandemic isn't over yet, and there is a lot we don't know like how many people actually have had COVID but not been counted because they were asymptomatic or only had mild symptoms. But I'm going to make a out on the limb, slightly educated guess that 25 years from now, I wouldn't be surprised if they decide that the mortality rate of COVID is approximately the same of what they saw during the Spanish flu. And later on, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how these numbers are very hard to pin down. And as we probably all realized over the last year, they fluctuate a lot too. The idea that they would end up being about the same seems a little odd to me, because if you think of it, you would think the experiences of 1918, which was a hundred years ago, would be a lot different than 2020. For example, just consider how much Traverse City has changed over that 100 years. This is a picture of the Park Place Hotel in approximately 1920. It was not even the, the brick building we see today, which was built in 1929. It was a clapboard white um, hotel sitting in the same location. This is the northwest corner of Union and State Streets. There's a three-story bank standing there now. There was a gas station there for decades. Uh, this was sort of a farmer's exchange building. It was called the Potato Exchange Building. I think of it as sort of a, a early farmer's market on that corner. So that has changed significantly. And then this is where the open space is today. 
This is the Morgan Canning Company. Uh, that street you see right in front of it is actually an eastern extension of Bay Street because Grandview Parkway wasn't there until the early 1950s. So if you think about 1918, compare it to 2020, lots of things have changed locally. On the other hand, a lot of things sort of look the same. This is a shot looking east on Front Street from Union. You can see the Hanalei building on the left, most of which is still there today. The furthest two bays burnt in 1940, but most of that building is still here. On the right, you can see the City Opera House, uh, second building down. And frankly, the streetscape looks really similar. And here's another shot of 1920 Traverse City. Uh, you can see the City Opera House, the Masonic building is already on the corner. That streetscape looks very similar. After researching this presentation, what actually strikes me the most is more the similarities between the Spanish flu and COVID rather than the differences. And you can see what you think after we go through the presentation. First similarity, the deadly impact of both the Spanish flu and COVID was deepened or at least quickened by massive international movement. Today, most of that movement comes from recreational and business travel, most of it by plane, some of it by uh, initially by cruise ship. During the Spanish flu, most of the initial uh, spread was tied directly to troop movements in World War I. And this photograph is actually of Louis Peter Till. Those of you that remember Peter Till drugs, that's that whole family, the Peter Till family, he was, he's part of that family. He's returning from his service during World War I. So this is in Traverse City at one of the train stations. Another similarity between the two eras is that in both cases, naming the illness was a point of contention. Today's virus's official name is COVID-19, but past President Trump and people in his administration frequently use the term Chinese virus or China virus to refer to it. And he did that on purpose. He had a political purpose for that. And the same kind of thing happened during World War I. Well, at least as far as we know now, COVID actually did first appear in China. The Spanish flu did not originate in Spain, nor was Spain the hardest hit country. What influenced the naming of that disease was the war to end all wars that was raging at the time. The pandemic flu, uh, the pandemic in 1918, 1920 became the Spanish flu because Spain was neutral during World War I. Thus, the press in Spain was pretty free and very quickly reported the spread of this very deadly illness as it went across Spain. Spanish or news coming out of Spain was the first that most people heard about the pandemic. On the other hand, European countries actually fighting in the war tightly controlled their news outlets. They stifled reports of the pandemic because they wanted to protect morale. And it's interesting to note that Donald Trump also stated that one of the reasons he downplayed the threat of the virus in the spring of 2020 was in order to not panic the public. So here we see another similarity between the two times. Some Americans feel Trump was correct in approaching the situation. And as we all know, others disagree. In early 1918, there were also varying opinions on how to present the threat of the Spanish flu to the public. And officials were then, as they are now, concerned about creating panic among the public. At first, many officials, perhaps honestly believing it, downplayed the threat of the flu. News of its existence began to spread in early 1918, although the worst spread and deaths didn't occur until much later in the year. Early in 1918, army officials issued a warning to soldiers and citizens about, among other things, sneezing. They warned that sneezing spread respiratory diseases like pneumonia, measles, meningitis, TB, and influenza. Their message to people, people should try not to sneeze. Also, they asked that they didn't spit 
Now, this particular photograph is not from Traverse City. It's from a Philadelphia newspaper, I believe. But you can see it says, spit spreads death. Now, in 1918, it was more publicly accepted for people to spit on the streets or in the bar rooms. And of course, spit holds viruses just like, you know, blowing your nose or coughing does. Now, the Record Eagle getting to local comments. The Record Eagle in the spring of 1918, this is a quote, says, all of these diseases mentioned are spread or communicated in the same way through the transfer of nasal and mouth secretions. The Record Eagle asked or stated that the sickness rates could be cut to the minimum if soldiers, because remember the first spread that people heard about was among the military, if soldiers and the general public as well stopped promiscuous coughing sneezing and spitting. Much like today and how different people see whether or uh, how different people think whether masks are effective or not, in 1918, the opinions about whether not spitting would be effective varied greatly. And because early on, most all of the news of deaths came from men dying in the military, the general public took a while to realize that this was going to spread from the military to other people also, to your common citizens. Again, the military deaths came first. On April 18, 1918, the Traverse City Record Eagle reported that Emil Priest, a recent recruit from Traverse City, had died of pneumonia at Fort Custer. And I'm sorry, this slide is a little fuzzy. But up in the top, I hope you can see Grand Rapids up there and down closer to Kalamazoo is Fort Custer, which opened in 1917 and is still open today. Anyway, he died or he had died very recently. He was a young man. He was in perfect health just before he died at age 22. And in fact, that's one of the big differences between the two pandemics. Today, we know that most of the people that are dying tend to be elderly or have very significant underlying health issues. In uh, the Spanish flu, a lot, the vast majority of people died who died were in their 20s and 30s. And I haven't read enough to figure out if they figured out why that happened. I think the statistics might be partly because so many people were in the military and it spread through the military. And of course, those military people tended to be younger and they were living in very crowded conditions. So that might have had some of the, might have been some of the reason why it was younger people that seemed to suffer more. So Priest had died at Fort Custer and then a little bit later in April, the newspaper reported that concerns were growing even more about the health of soldiers at Fort Custer, which had seen 72 new flu cases in one week. The paper reported that medical men were growing concerned because they had no means to treat the flu and lacked a good understanding of how it spread or how to stop it. On April 24th, the Record Eagle reported that another soldier from Traverse City had died in the United States uh, at a naval base near Boston. This young man was named um, Hanley Wilhelm, and those of you that know much about Traverse City history might recognize the Wilhelm name. They were, um, the Wilhelm family was one of the founders of the City Opera House. They ran a store on the corner of 8th and, um, 8th and Union Street that's now an AT&T store. They ran that store for decades. The building on the south West corner of Union and Front Street was uh, originally a five-story building built by a Wilhelm. Uh, it burnt, I can't remember the exact year, but the top three stories burnt. So uh, Hanley Wilhelm was uh, from a family that was very connected in the Traverse City community. And the reason I want to uh, show his picture, and I'm gonna show a couple of more pictures of him, is that during this research, I found some really interesting information about how humans process uh, sorrow and disaster. And apparently human beings don't process big numbers very well. And so you can you know, Google this and find out more information about it. I am not a medical or psychological 
expert, but what I read was that if you get much above 3,000, something 3,000 happening to more than 3,000 people at a time, our emotions and our psyche sort of begin to shut down because we're not hardwired to deal with that kind of um, disaster. And so it explains why I think, and this is just me thinking here, we think about the slightly under 2,000 people that died on 9-11. Horrible. Uh, it seems interesting to me that that event really seems to have moved our national psyche more than the fact that, I don't know if it's today, but up until recently, that many people were dying every day, we think, from COVID. And, but it adds up to like 300,000 people. And that number, that 300,000 number is just very hard for people to process. And there's a reason for that. It's not that they don't care. It's in part, we're not hardwired to process that kind of information. So I wanted to show Hanley as an example of the kind of person that was lost during the Spanish flu. Um, I have noticed in doing research for my uh, ancestry, looking back, building family trees, I keep running into people that are like, oh yeah, aunt so-and-so died during the Spanish flu. It, it, it seemed like it was a great enough number that it impacted enough people in the United States that many of us will have stories in our family history about that. This is a picture of Hanley. Uh, it, they, uh, the, the reason we have these is the Traverse Area District Library Archives, which is where all these historic photos are coming from, has an album that he put together for, between 1913 and 1915 when he took trips with friends around northern Michigan. He had a car which was somewhat unusual at the time. And this is Hanley Wilhelm uh, here, standing next to a First National Bank sign. Here he is with some friends out on the water. And he had a dog. There's like 15 or 20 pictures of this dog in the album. And again, not directly connected to the pandemic, but his life was cut short by it. It's interesting to note that American military deaths in World War I, 45,000 to the Spanish flu, 53,402 to combat deaths. So almost as many military people were lost to the flu as were lost to combat deaths. This is something that has changed over the years. In the Civil War, more, more military people died from disease than they did to combat deaths. Today, I've read statistics where today, Desert Storm, the battles in Iran and Iraq, that number has gone down even lower because medical ability has increased so much that we can say, and transporting people that have been hurt has improved so much that we're able to save many more people than we were 100 years ago or 170 years ago. And the same thing is playing in, we'll see more statistics later on, as far as the percentage of people that are dying from the Spanish, uh, from COVID. Percentage wise, it's going down, partly because our medical treatments have increased so much. Oops, wrong way. And this is just, again, trying to get back to highlighting the individuals that were lost to the Spanish flu. This is a collage, uh, a photo that the Traverse Area District Library has of the military, and they are all men, I think they were all men from Traverse City, who died during the war. And we don't know which ones from this, which ones died from disease and which one died from combat, combat wounds. It's a mix on this. We know that Hanley Wilhelm died from disease, uh, we, I know from my own personal research from before this that Lieutenant Harry Holliday and I believe Lawrence Bowen, who is up in the right corner as you look, I know Halliday died from combat wounds. And both of them, the local military VFW post is named after in their honor. Uh, so if you look through those, you might see names of people that you recognize from Traverse City families that are still here. American deaths from Spanish flu, 675,000. There are 
stories coming out now or predictions that we may hit close to that from the pandemic. Of course, uh, in 1920 or so, the American population was about 103 million. Today it's 300 and some. So the percentage, even if we were to hit 600,000 percentage wise, we're not on track to lose as great a percentage of our population as they did during the Spanish flu. The other thing that came up with these statistics is they are all over the place. And if you're anything like me, as you've been following COVID and you hear how many people have it and how many, it, it, it seems like the statistics, I don't think, I personally don't think anybody is doing this on purpose, but they do seem to shift and move. I think it's because they come up with new ways of testing and they test more people, et cetera. But looking back at the Spanish flu, the statistics range from 17 million people dying from the Spanish flu worldwide to 100 million. It's a huge difference. And sort of the middle says, well, somewhere between 20 and 50 million people. That's a, that's a huge range. So again, a similarity, maybe we shouldn't be surprised, be so surprised that even 100 years later, the numbers seem to shift a little and they're doing, in my opinion, the best to figure it out. However, there is no argument, and as I think today, there is no argument that a lot of people are dying from these pandemics. In Michigan, of all flu deaths, all of 1917, 544 deaths were recorded from the flu. Just from October to December in 1918, at the height of the Spanish flu pandemic, Michigan had 6,336 deaths attributed to the flu. So, you know, the numbers may be a little wishy-washy, but they're big enough that obviously a lot of people were catching this and dying from it. Just as with COVID, I'll tell you what this slide is in a minute. Just as with COVID, the summer of 1918, like the summer of 2020, offered a respite from the ravages of disease with the numbers of cases and deaths falling. But when the flu season returned in the fall of 1918, it returned with a vengeance. What's considered the second wave of the pandemic is believed to have begun near Boston. Soon breakouts surged across the country. Nearer to Michigan, Fort Custer was again a center for spread. At one time, it reported 1,000 cases, 1, cases of flu appearing overnight. On October 10th, the Record Eagle announced that the disease had arrived in Traverse City. 10 people had fallen ill. The paper declared, quote, while Traverse City has a few cases of Spanish flu and the State Board of Health does not consider the situation serious, it seems that something should be done by local health authorities to take every possible precaution against the epidemic. October 24th, 1918, saw this area's first death from the Spanish flu uh, of someone that was actually living here at the time. It was a 14-year-old boy from Buckley, Smith Bright. By the end of the year, the flu or pneumonia and again, just like today, it's a little, you know, like people may have actually died from pneumonia, not the Spanish flu, but they had the Spanish flu. So it's considered a death from the Spanish flu because they probably would not have died if they hadn't also had the Spanish flu. But by the end of 1918, 34 Traverse City residents had died, 31 in December. The Record Eagle starts responding to this. By the end of October, it printed, citizens, it's, we are announcing that pool and billiard halls should be closed and that shoppers are asked to keep moving while they are in stores with other people. And the reason I put this slide up on the screen is because you can see the billiard hall down in the left-hand corner. That is the City Opera House. This is Judson E. Cameron's Billiards and Barber Shop. And if you look just to the right of it, just because it's there, you can see Vitruba Leathers, Leather Goods, which is still in that location. 
and is the longest running business in Traverse City. It was originally over on Cass Street next to the Boardman River, but it moved here quite soon after it was established and it's the longest continually running business in Traverse City. So that shutting down the billiard halls in October of 1918 was the beginning of restrictions in Traverse City. From the fall of 1918 well into 1919, government officials issued a series of ever stricter limitations on public life. These included quarantine, closures, and meeting bans. Again, this sounds really familiar to me. Also familiar to me is that there's numerous reports in the paper that residents were not listening and they were continuing to favorite frequent public theaters, dance halls, and billiard halls. This is especially true on November 8th, which was when the Allied victory over Germany was announced. No amount of concern. And some officials were saying, don't go out of the streets, don't celebrate, it's not a good time, we're in the middle of an epidemic. However, the police themselves led a parade down Front Street, and the paper reports that the parade included practically every motor car in Grand Traverse and thousands of people gathered on the street to celebrate. So perhaps it wasn't a surprise that only a few days later, the Record Eagle reported that 50 new cases of flu had been diagnosed on Old Mission. The article also said, you know what? We probably need to stay cautious and try not to congregate and stay out of the stores. By November 20th, two of those people on Old Mission had died. There was an outbreak in Maple City, there was an outbreak in Cedar, there was an outbreak in Kinsley. Obviously, we're in October and November now of 1918 and things were getting worse. Around this time, the county's health director, who was Dr. E.L. Thurlby, attended a conference, conference on the flu in Chicago. Now, Thurlby, you probably recognize his name, uh, he was the founder of the Thurlby Medical Clinic, which is still running today. And he's also the namesake of Thurlby Field, uh, which the high schools in Traverse City use for their football games and practices. Anyway, he attended a uh, conference on the flu in Chicago and supposedly returned with some ideas about how to uh, stop the spread of the flu. Yet again, another similarity, just like we have experienced today, the information Thurlby brought back from Chicago was confusing at best. On one hand, he reported that he had learned about the importance of hand washing, saying, quote, it is urged that hands be washed always before sitting down for a meal and after the meal is done. On the other hand, the Record Eagle reports Thurlby as saying, quote, the entire medical profession is in the dark as to proper methods of combating the flu. So does that sound a little familiar? I mean, I know depending on where you get your news from your, today, you're gonna get different um, advice on how to combat, combat COVID, but the truth of the matter, that advice is very different. And that was, is quite similar to what happened in 1918. Interestingly, in none of my reading, which was relatively thorough, there was no mention in the local press about wearing masks. That said, masks were recommended nationwide and worn or not worn, another similarity to today, across the country. So this uh, photo is from the National Archives. And it is of police in Seattle. And as you can see, they are definitely masked up. This is a photograph, again, from the National Archives uh, showing a woman wearing a mask. Uh, she was a typist in New York City. And apparently, you know, New York, again, being a very crowded city, had horrible outbreaks of the flu, just like it experienced COVID. And a lot of people were wearing masks there. Another similarity was a call for people to gather outside rather than indoors. So here is another shot, this again, a National Archive shot of a court being held outside in San Francisco. 
Coming back to Traverse City, by late November, Record Eagle reported that there had been three more deaths in the town and hundreds of new cases being reported. A day later, still late November, there was a heading, epidemic extends to all parts of the Grand Traverse region. And on December 26th, the headline said, local situation grows alarming during the past few days. By Christmas, the epidemic, this, we're still in 1918, by Christmas, the epidemic overwhelmed Traverse City's tiny and adequate hospital, which was located in a former boarding house just south, south of the Traverse City State Hospital. So we had this huge state hospital in Traverse City at the time, but it was a mental institution. It was not a hospital for someone to go to when they broke their leg or they got cancer or TB, uh, although there were wards connected to it that were TB wards, but its primary focus was on people who um, were having depression and mental issues. There were a few, uh, again, I'm not not necessarily exactly in 1920, but over those decades, there were a few private hospitals in Traverse City that people could go to. And Dr. Munson, this had this house you're seeing here, had been a boarding house and Dr. Munson had turned it into a small hospital by the time the flu hit, but it was very quickly overrun and a wing for Spanish flu victims was opened up at the state hospital. Interestingly enough, the, the inability of this small hospital to handle the Spanish flu cases led directly to the opening of Munson Hospital, which today is Munson Medical Center. And this is about a 1926 picture of the front of, of the original Munson Medical Center. And to the best of my knowledge, this entire building is still inside Munson Medical Center somewhere. I don't think even the front was torn down. I know you can still see the back of it. If you drive around back, you can still see the, bra the back brick of this two-story building. Um, so in an interesting way, people today from our area that are being treated at a state-of-the-art facility at Munson Medical Center for COVID have the Spanish flu victims to thank for the existence of that modern medical center because it was directly because of the Spanish flu that there had been calls for a more modern medical facility before the Spanish flu, but that emergency sort of kick-started those calls and made it possible for the months of medical to be built. And here is, and I, I apologize, it's a little fuzzy, but this is a picture of influenza victims being crowded into an emergency hospital in Kansas in 1918. So if you remember the pictures that have pop up occasionally of those tents in New York City and down in Texas and out in Seattle where they've had to set up or use auditoriums to put people into them. Of course, in 1918, they didn't, at least in this photo, they didn't even have dividers up between the soldiers, but we have across the world seen uh, various countries and states have to use this kind of facility modernized to take care of victims of COVID. But even with the area's medical facilities being stretched to capacity, apparently many still did not take the 1918 epidemic seriously. The Record Eagle reported, quote, for instance, it is asserted that although the disease has a serious grip on the state and or on the state hospital, people are still seeing employees, state hospital employees, go downtown patronizing theaters, dance halls, billiard parlors, etc. There are, it is stated, about 30 cases of influenza at the state hospital. This is still from the Record Eagle. During the working hours, the attaches and assistants at the state hospital wear anti-flu masks and exercise caution to prevent spread of the disease. When night arrives, some of them slip off their masks and go downtown where they mingle freely with the crowds with a total disregard for the safety of others. 
So again, a similarity, a split within the public and within the medical community as to how to approach it. My sense as I was reading this is, gosh, not there's an awful lot that hasn't changed. I do have a couple of photographs. I am not saying these are three nurse trainees from the state hospital. The picture was taken in about 1919. I am not saying that these three women were part of the people that were running downtown and going to the billiard halls, et cetera. I don't know that, but you can see how they were uniformed and what they looked like here in Traverse City at the time of the Spanish flu epidemic. Same thing with this woman, not saying that she was not paying attention to the restrictions, but we do know her name is Julia A. Thorson. This uh, picture was taken either in 1918 or 1919. She graduated from the Traverse City State Hospital Training School for Nurses in 1911, and she served in the military as a nurse during the Spanish flu epidemic between 1918 and 1919 in the U.S. Army. So we're at the end of 1918, things are getting worse in Traverse City. On January 2nd, Dr. Thurlby declared an absolute quarantine of every home afflicted with the disease. So the stores and off and on the schools and the billiard halls, et cetera, are still open, but Thurlby has decided to quarantine strictly anyone that actually has the flu and isn't sick enough to go to the hospital has to stay in their home. But it soon became apparent that just like today, the public and even medical officials disagreed on what measures were necessary or prudent to contain the pandemic. Very broadly speaking, in Traverse City, Dr. Thurlby actually seemed to be on the loose side of this, of this set of opinions. Although he did quarantine people into their homes, he very soon lifted that quarantine. Oops, wrong way. Oops, there we go. <laughs> this is a picture of um, W.M. Coddington in his life, who at the beginning of 1919 was the local public health and welfare director. He represents the other end of the spectrum, who he pretty much felt everything should be shut down until we could control the Spanish flu. And in January 19, he called for the closing of all schools, churches, theaters, and all public and non-essential gatherings for an indefinite period of time. The trick to this is he called for this just as he was leaving office. So it was never actually, it may have been implemented for a few days. I don't know if it was or how it was implemented if it was, but he left office and um, Thurlby was still there and that was uh, lifted very soon thereafter. Also like today, different geographic regions responded to the pandemic differently and attempted to lay blame on each other for their deteriorating situations. And that happened locally. For example, in mid-January of 1919, officials in Leelanau County expressed displeasure with how Grand Traverse County was handling the pandemic. A meeting was held in Lake Leelanau between state officials and every township health -ish official from Leelanau County and every doctor in the county. And Leelanau County declared a blockade at its borders with Grand Traverse County. Officials stated that Grand Traverse, or that uh, Leelanau County had between 200 and 300 flu cases at the time, and they claimed that all of them had come from Traverse City. So their thought was the spread wasn't happening in Leelanau County. People were going to Grand Traverse County and coming back, or they were visiting from Grand Traverse County and bringing it to Leelanau County. Now it's unclear what effect that, I don't know if I mentioned, but the blockade was that if you came into Leelanau County from outside, you would have to undergo a four day quarantine before you were allowed to go out in public. And you had obviously had to stay healthy during that time. It's unclear what good that quarantine did and it was lifted by February 5th by the State Board of Health. That was partly because by February of 1919, 
the cases across the world and uh, in the state and in the United States were beginning to go down. There were outbreaks of the Spanish flu lasting throughout 1919, but they became much less frequent and deaths began to go down during 1919. And the epidemic was pretty much over by the spring of 2020. For nearly two years, Northern Michigan, along with the rest of the world, reeled under the onslaught of the Spanish flu. In spite of a passage, the passage of 100 years, much seems to have remained the same. Our world is still very connected and for different reasons. Officials waver between reassuring the public and begging for public to take the public to take very um, strict public health measures. Some in the public respond to those restrictions, others resist. One could argue that it's possible that even the death rates from two, the two diseases may end up being similar. If they don't, I, I ran some figures on some numbers that I found and I would say that it sounded like in the United States from the Spanish flu, approximately, let's see if I can find my numbers. Approximately a half of a percent of the American population died from the Spanish flu epidemic. So not 1% of the population, but about half of a percent. If we end up losing 500,000 Americans to COVID, that would be approximately a quarter of a percent of the American population today. I think the biggest reason for that, and these numbers are fluid, they're estimate, but it looks like percentage wise, we will not lose as many people, which is a good thing. It's because of the medical advances. We have so much, many more ways to treat people that are suffering from this illness than we had before. So for the same reasons that fewer people in the military die, a smaller percentage of people in the military die, from combat wounds today than they did during the Civil War or World War I. Same reason, hopefully, a smaller percentage of people will die from this pandemic than they did from the Spanish flu pandemic. I wanna end with just a little bit of something happy. At the beginning of this presentation, one of the things I stated was that we today our what we today are experiencing during COVID is just within the living memory of a few people that experienced the Spanish flu epidemic. There are a few people worldwide that are you know, in their early 100s that can remember that Spanish flu pandemic. And there's even a few that survived both having Spanish flu and COVID. Now, I did not find someone like that in Traverse City, but I found a really awesome story about this woman. Her name is Anna Del Priori, and she's from Middletown, New Jersey. She was born in 1913, the year that the Titanic sank. When she was six years old, she got the Spanish flu. Obviously, she survived because here we have her picture at 107. She got COVID last summer and she survived. So I'm not, I mean, she could have died since then, but she survived COVID, she survived the Spanish flu. And what I love is this last picture I have. This is Anna in the 19, uh, whenever she looks like she's in her 20s or 30s though, she was a tango dancer. And her husband was a professional tango dancer. And the thought that crossed my mind when I looked at this woman and thought, man, she lived to be 107, she survived the Spanish flu, she survived COVID, that maybe exercise really is good for us. Because I'm assuming she exercised a lot if she were a professional dancer. 
So we have a lot that's similar, a few things that are different. Um, most of us are gonna survive this. It has changed our lives significantly. I would argue it's probably changed our lives a little bit more than it changed most of the lives of the people in the United States during the Spanish flu, because it is my impression that the shutdowns and shutting down the businesses and stuff and that kind of thing was done on a much more local basis rather than nationwide. And it was not, it doesn't appear to me that it was as long, it didn't last as long and it wasn't as widespread. This is not the place for me to make a comment whether I think that's a good idea or a bad idea. We don't need to get into that. It is a difference, but they survived and so will we. Now I'm willing to take any questions uh, if there are any, are there any questions? <laughs> Yeah, I have a few in the chat. And if anyone wants to kind of raise their hand, I'll try to scroll through and unmute people if I can see. I know a lot of people don't have video enabled either. Um, but I do have some in the chat. So that would be the easiest way because then I can just give them to Peg. Um, from Anne Magoon, uh, were there long lasting after effects or health effects from the Spanish flu? That, that, you know that I haven't researched. So I can't give you a definite yes for that. However, as a historian, and I know that I've got a couple of other historians here, uh, I do believe that I have read a lot of either fiction or nonfiction about the 1920s and 1930s. And certainly there are references, you know, to people that never really quite recovered. That is totally not a scientific answer. <laughs> at all. <laughs> but my suspicion is there, and there were certainly repercussions from the fact that so many people died. Um, I ran into an interesting statistic. I won't remember the exact numbers, but it was about the mortality rate in Michigan of people between the ages of like 22 and 35 and how much it went up in those two years, in 1918, and it went up, I, I want to say 10 to 12 percent, just as an effect of the Spanish flu. Yeah, um, this, this is a great kind of local poignant question. Do you know if the Traverse City Library or any libraries around here had to close in eight, 1918 or 1919? Don't know. Then run into that. Yeah, that's it's funny. The public gathering spaces, right? Yeah, um, my, impre my impression was all the way through the reading I did that it was much less strictly enforced than it is today. And right. what the legal reasonings for that was, I don't know. But the Record Eagle sort of consistently talked about how places were closed and then they were open and they were open even though they were told to be closed. And it was just my impression that it was not imposed nearly as strictly as it has been today. Right. Um, were there any unorthodox treatment suggestions such as ingesting bleach or alternative, yeah, right? Alternative medicines. Not that I ran into, but that okay. doesn't mean there weren't. I mean, my right. research was somewhat limited, so yeah. But that those would be, yeah, those interesting, like tiny little historical stories. Yes. Well, um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. If people are having trouble, you know, kind of and have, and if you think about this this presentation later and, and want to know more information, you're always welcome to um, message us on Facebook from the Histor Traverse Area Historical Society, or even um, find us or send us an email. Uh, that's traversehistory at gmail.com. Um, and we're happy to get back to you. Local history questions. Tattle is a great resource as well. Oh, and we do just have a question that just came in. Um, and this is a great one with the idea of archives. Um, the question is, what should we be documenting today when we're thinking about this? And I know you, you've started something with this, Peg. Um, I have. Uh... I, if you are journaling at all, I think that is an awesome thing to document. And I know the library 
is collecting things. The Historical Society has collected a few things from people earlier on. And, and this is you know, making me think about this. It's, it's good to revisit this. Um, early on, we had we put out a request for people to send in their thoughts and their experiences. And we collected quite a few of those then. As this is drug on, I think everybody has sort of like, I, I, I don't, I, I know there were people that thought it would last this long because my oldest son, who's 30 something, sort of said that like last March and I'm like, oh, really? But I think a lot of us didn't think it was gonna be a year or two, but you look at the Spanish flu, again, getting back to the comparisons, um, it took two years for it to completely play out. Yeah. And in the last, you know, less than half of that two years, it was much less um, widespread. And I think things got somewhat back to normal again. But again, I see a similarity there. But back, yes, if you, the newspapers, the articles that are showing in newspapers, those are all pretty well being archived. So it would be your personal experiences. You know, what, write down what does it feel like not to have seen some of your family members for 10 months? Uh, that kind of thing. And I, as an archivist, I no longer work at the library, but I'm sure they would be very happy to have that kind of thing sent in to them because that's what we're gonna lose today, by and large, we don't have the letters. You know, you can, or by and large, we don't have letters. We're texting each other. That what, you know, I've been video conference, conferencing with my kids. I don't think any of that's being recorded. That's, and we're not gonna have the letters going back and forth from people talking about those things. So making the effort to either record things or to write them down and then hand them in. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and the idea that we are living through history and people will look back on this and, and kind of want to see those kind of first person stories. Yeah, I think that's great to remind people. Also from Susan Odgers, um, do grave headstones locally list the Spanish flu if there's if there's deaths associated with? Um. I don't recall them, Larry. I'm, I can see, you're one of the people I can see, Larry. Can you either unmute or shake your head? I don't, I know there are World War I headstones in Oakwood Cemetery that are obviously military, but I don't recall if any of them actually list a death from the flu rather than from combat. Larry, do you have any information? Not that I've ever seen any more than they list, uh you know, arterial sclerosis or uh, pneumonia. Or right, right. Um, you'll often see um, headstones when you, this is what I do with my life, walk around the cemetery. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I remember seeing in Oakwood, I'll see like headstones of infants that are like from 1918, 1919. And it often crosses my mind, you know, did they, you know, did they, die from the Spanish flu. And, but it's, it's not written down there. All right. Yeah, if I, that, that's all the questions I see in the chat. So um, again, you know, you can get a hold of us in, in many different ways. If you have more questions about local Traverse City history, we have a great wealth of knowledge um, on the board. And we're pretty passionate about getting these stories to you. So. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us again. Thanks, Peg, for presenting. Anything else you'd like to add? No, nope, not that I can think of other than, yes, you know, please, if it was Susan that mentioned, you know, recording things, uh, do, do. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, 100 years from now, people are going to be doing, in fact, one of the reasons I want to live for another 25, 30 years as I want to see how all this is represented by historians. And I might just make another 25 <laughs> and see how they look back on all this and uh, start examining it. And uh, yeah. 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 Well, again, thanks everyone for attending. This, this has been recorded. And so um, 
This presentation will put up on the Traverse Area Historical Society Facebook page. It also will be included on the Traverse Area District Library YouTube channel. Um, and so you certainly can come back and revisit it. Um, so thanks again. And we'll be, we'll be ending our meeting now. And oh, we just got a question in at the end. And this is great because it speaks to what you were talking about, Peg. Where can people share their COVID experiences? Um, there is a collection going at the Traverse Area District Library archives. Also contact um, the Historical Society. We can get you the right place. Is that correct, Peg? Uh, yes, and I also know, I don't know if they're still doing it, but uh, you, I, I think it's done, but I know the National Rider Series early on had something going on where they were collecting stories, but I don't know if they're still doing that or not. Okay. Thanks again. And we'll be ending our meeting and everyone, oh, Leland Awe Historical Society is collecting as well. Great okay. as we go. Um, well, great. Everyone have a great Saturday. Enjoy the sun out there. Um, and we'll see you later. Hey.